Neil McCluskey has been a presenter for CFU for a number of years now, and we are excited to have him back again this year. Neil is the director of Cato's Center for Educational Freedom and is a well-known author and speaker on various radio programs regarding issues facing educators. He also maintains Cato's public schooling map, Battle Map, an interactive database of values and identity-based conflicts in public schools. We are thankful to have him presenting today on current policies affecting educators. Thanks, Amanda. And it's great to be with you all. It's always terrific to talk to, to you all at, at CFU. And thanks for having me back. Um, my name is Neil McCluskey again. I'm the director of the Center for Educational Freedom at the Cato Institute. Just a quick bit on Cato. If you don't know about us, uh, we are a libertarian oriented uh, sort of full service national think tank. By full service, I mean we do lots of different areas. We certainly do education policy, uh, but we do work in constitutional law, in foreign policy, monetary policy, so we kind of run the gamut. Uh, and then we're national in that we do lots of sort of national level issues, a lot of work in Washington, uh, but Education, as I'm going to talk about, constitutionally uh, belongs not in Washington, but in the states and with the people. And so a lot of what my work is is at the state level, uh, where it should be. So what I'm going to talk to you a little bit about is there's certainly things going on in the federal government that the federal government has done in education. I'll talk about those. Um, but a lot of what's really important is happening at the state level, and so I'm going to talk about state level uh, action too. And that's where we're seeing, I think, the most promising things happening in education. So just a little bit of the things that are, are going on in, ed, in the federal government. Sort of an overview is one of the major reasons we're not likely to see a lot in 2023 coming out of the federal government is, of course, powers divided. Uh, the Republicans have a very slim House majority. Democrats have a slim Senate majority. And of course, President Biden is a Democrat in the White House. But all this means that even if something gets through one House or the other, a not a lot is likely to actually get passed. Certainly nothing controversial. So the first piece of legislation that you're probably directly interested in, you probably know more about it than I do, uh, but is the PRO Act. Uh, the PRO Act has been introduced before. It was uh, reintroduced again this year. Uh, it would break down many protect protections that people have against force being used to, put the, to require them to join a union. Um, but this doesn't have much chance of passing. It's certainly not going to make it through uh, a Republican-controlled House. And even in the past in the Senate, some Democrats have voted against it. Democrats who are still there. For instance, Senator uh, Sinema voted against it. So I don't expect that the PRO Act is going to go anywhere. In the House, we've seen a passage of the Parents' Bill of Rights Act. Um, this is something that would do uh, many things that are actually pretty good. So we should want, for instance, uh, school districts to be required to publish information about what their curricula are, uh, what books are in their school libraries. We would want to know what their budget is. And the uh, Parents' Bill of Rights Act calls on school districts or require them to publish a lot of that information. It would also do things that are a little bit more minutia. For instance, it would require that all parents be uh, given at least two parent-teacher conferences a year. The problem, of course, is one, it's not going to go any further than the House. It did pass in the House, but there's no chance that the, or at least a very slim chance, uh, that a democratically controlled, a Democrat party controlled Senate is going to pass the Parents' Bill of Rights Act. They opposed it pretty, uh, pretty uh, powerfully uh, and pretty energetically in the House. And it is going beyond what the federal government has given authority to do. You want certainly sunlight shown on what happens in school districts, but the federal government is only given specific enumerated powers. It has no other powers besides those. And education and the ability, the authority to govern an education is not among them. So while these may be good things, the federal government doesn't have authority to try to coerce them or try and force them. That's one reason that actually five Republicans voted against the Parent Bill of Rights Act in the House. But again, 
like anything in Washington that's controversial, this has no chance of making it through the Senate and through the White House, or at least almost no chance. I suppose anything is possible, but this is extremely unlikely. Um, the other sort of major piece of education legislation that we're seeing uh, in Washington is the Educational Choice for Children's Act. This is uh, sponsored by Senator Tim Scott of South Carolina. It would create a $10 billion scholarship tax credit uh, at the federal level. Uh, it's certainly well intended. What we should want is school choice. We want power to be put in the hands of parents and families uh, and taken away from school districts and state legislators. Uh, we want it to be something that people control, that families control. And so it's well intended. But again, the federal government has no authority to govern an education. The reason that we have federal taxation is to raise revenue so that the federal can do, government can do the things that it has given specific power to do, not so that it can use the tax code to engineer outcomes in areas it has no authority over. So the federal government has no authority to govern an education. Therefore, it doesn't have the authority to use the tax code to try and do things that states won't do on their own in education. In this case, something very good to enable more families to choose schools, but we can't allow the federal government to do things just because we happen to like the outcome. Uh, but again, this has no chance or almost no chance of passing the Senate, uh, and the, it has to pass the Senate, of course, to become law. Uh, it, I don't think it's been introduced in the House yet. If it is, it'll pass the House. But again, won't make it through the Senate. And even if it made it through both houses of Congress, there is almost no chance that President Biden would sign it. So it's a good thing um, to have choice. Federal government shouldn't be doing it, and it's not likely to pass. Now, where we're seeing other movement in Washington is in a way that things can happen, but in violation of how the Constitution is supposed to work. So what we've been seeing for growing for many decades, and we see it more every year, is law essentially being made through regulation. So instead of Congress passing a law that says something, the executive branch, the White House, the president, uh, says, well, we will interpret law in this way and essentially make new law. And the two, well, the one area where we're seeing the federal government likely to do a lot is through Title IX, which is sort of the education civil rights enforcement um, law, but that is usually uh, and far too often changed and filled in by the executive branch saying, no, we're gonna look at this differently. So under the Ob uh, Obama administration, uh, they actually, instead of even going through a regulatory process, they sent out what were called dear colleague letters that told schools and school districts and colleges, hey, we're reinterpreting our regulations so that you have to do lots of different things. The Biden administration at least is not changing regulation through dear colleague letters, but they are promulgating new regulations. Uh, the first one is maybe the one you've heard the most about. It has to do with uh, athletics and especially transgender students and which sports teams they can participate in. We've seen many states have passed laws that said you can only participate on the athletic team that is consistent with your sex at birth. Many people have said, well, this is a violation of equal rights. This has been a major dispute. And different states and different school districts have different, taken different positions on it. And the, Obama, or the Biden administration said, well, we're going to write a regulation that settles it. But actually, this regulation doesn't settle it. They've sort of tried to split the baby on this. So what they said is, in this regulation, no school, no district, at least that gets federal funds, can have a blanket ban on students participating on sports teams that they choose based on their gender identity. They said you can't have a blanket ban where you say that's never allowed. 
The way they've sort of split the baby, though, is to say, but if as a school or a school district, you think that there's a competitive advantage for a student to say, well, I was born uh, as a male, but I want to play on the female teams, you can forbid that because you think there's an unfair competitive advantage for that student. The other thing they said is, well, if you feel there is a safety concern, and there have been examples of students, of, of athletes being hurt um, by students who are not of the same biological sex as they were, this regulation says if you think that there are safety reasons, you can also say you cannot participate on this team. And you know, the, I, it may very well be an honest effort to try and accommodate everybody, to be as inclusive as you can of everybody's concerns. But the reality is, almost certainly most school districts will be very protective of themselves. And they'll say, it's too dangerous for us to say, well, we are going to say you cannot participate on a sport based on the, the team that you choose because of safety or competitiveness issues because we will be accused, the districts will fear, of discriminating. And this regulation says, you know, you can't really discriminate. It has to be for safety or for competitiveness. And if you're accused of only using those as an excuse to discriminate, suddenly you have to essentially prove your innocence. And you are, as a school district, will be exposed to lots of bad publicity, if nothing else, expensive investigations. And so my guess is, no matter what the intent of the White House with this regulation, most school districts, the vast majority, and maybe all, will say, we're just gonna say anybody can participate in a sport based on what they choose because it would be too much of a burden and too dangerous for us to try and defend a decision not to allow that. So that's the first major Title IX change that we're seeing. The second one has to do with sexual assault and harassment. Much of that is really focused more on colleges and universities than on K through 12 schools. Much of the debate since the Obama Dear Colleague letters have been about what level of evidence is necessary uh, to, for a college to punish, including expel a student who is accused of uh, assault or harassment. Uh, the Obama administration said you must use just a preponderance of evidence standard. Basically what that means is if you are 51% kind of certain that the person accused has actually done the thing they're accused of, this college can and should expel them. The Trump administration changed that so that you could use a higher level of evidentiary requirements uh, than the Obama Dear Colleague letter used. People were angry about all of these regulations and all of the changes on different sides. The Biden administration has now promulgated new regulations that go back to that um, preponderance of evidence standard also includes um, new protections for people based on their gender identity and changes the definition of harassment to make it much more inclusive. But that also means that it puts schools in much greater danger of s seeming to step over the harassment uh, threshold and makes them uh, or incentivizes them to punish students more often even if something may not seem like harassment, even if it just seems like kids joking around. Again, this puts the school districts and the schools on the defensive and puts them in a sort of conservative stance, in conservative meaning, let's just not take any chances and let's use the highest bar that we, or the lowest bar for harassment, but the highest bar of discipline so that we don't have the federal government kind of coming after us. So there's gonna be a lot of debate about those regulations, uh, and those latter regulations are supposed to take effect at the beginning of the upcoming school year, so the 2023-24 school year, assuming that the regulations are finally approved, and that is expected. And so that sort of takes care of what's going on at the federal level. Again, there's not gonna be a whole lot, especially outside of regulation that happens, except for one other thing that I should mention uh, that is not at all about K through 12, but may actually generate the most media attention and the most debate 
is uh, President Biden, as you probably know, uh, issued sort of a mass cancellation uh, last August of federal student loans. Uh, anybody in a household making up to $250,000, if they got a Pell Grant, can get $20,000 of their debt forgiven. Uh, that has gone to the Supreme Court. Uh, if the Supreme Court, well, the Supreme Court will rule on it. We expect, could be any time really, but the most sort of controversial decisions usually come at the end of the term, so maybe June we'll see this. Um, no matter what the ruling is on that, if they strike down as cancellation or they uphold it, that's actually probably the thing in federal education broadly that'll get the most attention uh, because it has the most immediate impact on a lot of people. And again, it wasn't done by legislation. This time it wasn't even done by regulation. It was done by executive fiat, which is a major reason it's considered unconstitutional. So that is kind of all the federal stuff. And then we get to the states and it's at the state level where most education policy should be done, uh, and that's what's happening. Again, the Constitution doesn't give the federal government authority over education, which means it stays with the states or the people. The people decide whether the states are in charge of education, actually, or the people themselves retain that. But every state constitution has provisions for education, so it's generally seen as a state-level concern. Um, and lots of things are happening in the states, most encouraging is that we've had a huge explosion of universal school choice programs. So by universal, what I mean is there is not an income cap where if you make more than 200% you know, of the poverty level, you're no longer able to get all of these happen to have been education savings accounts. So you couldn't get a money in an education savings account. Um, could be a voucher though, could be lots of different mechanisms. But when you have that income cap, it's not universal because lots of people aren't eligible. We also often see school districts where they say, well, you can, or sorry, school choice laws where they say, you can only access a voucher or an education savings account if you're in a school district that has a low level of performance. Often states have report cards, so only if you're in a D or an F rated school district can you get school choice. These universal programs say, no, everybody should be eligible for school choice because the standard, the norm, should be choosing how your children are educated, not being assigned to a school based on your home address. So just since basically between January and March of 2023, four states passed universal school choice programs. Prior to that, there were only two. West Virginia passed one in 2021. Uh, Arizona passed one in 2022. Uh, since then, we have seen uh, Arkansas and Utah and uh, Iowa. Um, and there's one other I forgot, so I'm going to just look it up. Um, oh, and Florida. All have now um, gone to universal school choice programs. So that's six states with universal school choice where previously, if you go back to 2020, no states had that. Um, and we see lots of other states that are looking to expand school choice or to create new school choice programs. Uh, North Carolina, Texas, uh, and a number of other states are, are looking to do that. Texas would be a particularly big state to have school choice. Many people are surprised that it doesn't have private school choice programs. Um, there's always been a difficulty of it's always been hard to get Democrats on board for school choice. But in many cases, rural Republicans also resist school choice. That's been the problem in Texas. But this has been the most concerted effort we've seen to get private school choice in Texas. So it may also have school choice, would, would be a huge additional state to have. So school choice has moved a lot. We used to, in the school choice kind of community, uh, refer to 2021 as the year of school choice. In that year, 19 states either created new programs or expanded existing programs. That's pretty good. But 2023 may be shaping up to be the new year of school choice. Even if 19 states don't do something new, this huge increase in the number of universal programs is just a sea change in school choice, away from what used to be small targeted programs to the assumption that everybody should be eligible to take the money to educate their kids to the schools or other educational arrangements that they think are best. So that is a really big thing happening in states and something to be very optimistic about. 
The other things that are happening in states we've seen a lot in 2022, and I expect will continue. The major sort of trend that we've seen are often called divisive concept laws. These are laws aimed to control the teaching of things that people see as coming under what's often called critical race theory. Um, the idea basically that the country suffers from systemic racism and all sorts of problems can be reduced to simply systemic racism. Uh, those, uh, we see a lot of those divisive concept laws have been passed, continue to be debated in many states. Kind of related to those are laws that are trying to curb what many people call the teaching of gender ideology or essentially teaching kids that there's a spectrum of genders. It tends to encompass a lot beyond gender identity to lots about how you just teach sex ed. And we're seeing many states that are debating and passing laws to control that. Probably the most famous is the Florida law, or infamous, depending on your viewpoint, um, but that was derided by opponents as the don't say gay bill. What this bill said was basically in grades K through three, teachers are not supposed to talk about sex or gender related issues. Um, and we're seeing more and more states that have debated those and have passed those just to put a little number on how ubiquitous the divisive concept laws have been. Uh, a organization or center in UCLA has studied this and found that every state except one since 2019, and that one state, that outlier is Delaware, has debated at least uh, uh, one of these divisive concepts or anti-CRT laws. I don't know how Delaware managed not to do that, but that gives you an idea of how ubiquitous these are because these are burning sort of cultural conflicts and schools, public schools, where you require diverse people with diverse backgrounds, diverse beliefs, diverse ideas to all pay for one system of school, for one district, inevitably that leads to these conflicts because you either teach things people object, one group objects to, or you don't teach things other people want, or they object to, it's a zero sum game. So these battles are inevitable and we are certainly seeing them. Related to that is, just as we talked about the federal government had a parental bill of rights, many states are debating a parental bill of rights. Some have passed it. Um, and they do very similar things to what the federal law would do. Uh, requirements that, that school districts publish their curriculum, that parents be able to see the syllabus for their children's classes. Um, and protections for privacy. For instance, that schools can't sell student data to vendors, um, or that they can't withhold information about a child's medical um, condition, or in particular, if a child says that they think they are uh, a different gender than their sex at birth, they can't withhold that information from parents. All of these things are parts of parent bills of rights, and we're seeing those bills in many places. Uh, the most recent count was as of March of 2023, 32 states had seen such legislation, debated such legislation to show kind of the momentum behind that. In 2022, only 18 states had seen such legislation. So, this is sort of a growing thing, and we will expect it to be kind of a hot issue in 2023. Um, there are two other things that may kind of fly a little bit more underneath the radar, um, but that are kind of growing, and really kind of growing as battles really at the beginning of 2023. The first one is about reading. Now, we've actually had reading wars for a long time, and they've usually come down to as the best way to teach reading phonics, where kids learn letter sounds and the sounds of combination of the letters and that sort of the building blocks of putting together words, or is it best taught through whole language, where kids open books, see words, see pictures, and essentially memorize words and try and use clues of what words might be without learning sort of letter sounds and kind of how to build that word by seeing, by putting together letter sounds and letter combination sounds. Um, it's not actually a new battle. 
But there was a very popular podcast called Sold a Story, um, which ran, in, I think, entirely in 2022. Uh, but that really shone a light on the utter absence or almost complete absence of evidence behind whole language and very strong evidence that phonics worked. And a major proponent, probably the best named supporter of whole language or what's sometimes called balanced literacy where you put some phonics in but there's still a lot of whole language was a professor named Lucy Calkins. And as part of this podcast, she says, look, it's probably right, actually, that the evidence doesn't support what I've been saying is the best way to teach reading. And so there's now been this groundswell of people saying we need to do uh, reading that, is, that uses the science of reading. That's the instruction we should have. The New York Times ran a big article on how people are taking on the establishment now to get proper reading instruction. That may be a battle we see in, in many states and districts, and it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Again, this is not new information actually about reading, but it's typically been quashed, and we'll see if this really kind of takes off like wildfire uh, in this next year. And then the last thing we'll see is not really, uh, we certainly see this at state levels. Parents' Bill of Rights, divisive concept laws are all part of these same battles, but at the local level, I think we'll continue to see lots of conflicts about what books are in the school library, what books are on uh, teachers' shelves in their classrooms, what books are on reading lists. A lot of this has to do with race, a lot of it has to do with gender um, and, and sexuality. Uh, and what we've seen is sort of uh, really since 2021 uh, spread across the country parents re demanding that school, that books be removed, some books removed that they think are just inappropriate for their kids from libraries. Lots of uh, pushback against that saying this is banning of books and I don't see that going away. I actually think it's going to get more intense. Um, again, because public schools require people with diverse values and backgrounds to all pay for the same school. That makes these battles inevitable and there's no sign that either side is saying, okay, we give up, you win. And so I think we're gonna see a lot more of that played out at state level, certainly, and at the local level. And that's pretty much my view of what's coming down the pike uh, at the federal level, at the state level, and what's gonna be big in education policy in the year 2023 going into 2024.